be in 2025. And we're going to um, find single um, like widows, women who have lost their husbands in combat, yeah. who are, you know, living with their parents with their two kids because they can't afford rent or they can't afford to t take care of their kids because the statistic that we found is one out of 30 children in the United States is sleeping in their parents' car. Hey guys, my name is Julian and today I've got Pace Morby in the house and we're going to be talking about all things real estate, his life and where he plans to go in the future. And I've got uh, my friend Justin here, he's uh, my father-in-law and he's going to be uh, giving a testimonial for Pace today because uh, Pace has uh, changed your lives in, in many ways. So go ahead. Yeah. I Pace, I just wanted to pop on and say thanks because your, your Facebook page kind of changed my life. I started, uh, you know, getting into real estate about a year and a half ago. Uh, Julian actually was the one that kind of introduced me to, you know, real estate investing. He um, took me to a Grant Cardone seminar. And then after that, I started looking around at different Facebook pages and I stumbled across yours somehow. I don't even know how. And, uh, and just following it, seeing the community was great. But then I, I saw, uh, a gentleman named Mitch Armstrong um, post about some of his burrs that he was doing. And I became friends with him and then we ended, ended up partnering. And then over the last, I think nine months, I ended up owning 222 doors wow. total. And um, we've got another 250, hopefully going under contract in the next, uh, hopefully the next month or so here. We're wow. still working out the final details, but- that's a, you know, what's funny about that Facebook group is my partner fought me on it was like, I don't know why you, you want to start this thing. I don't, I want to have nothing to do with it. It's a waste of time. And <laughs> that went on for a year. And then I finally said, I'll just start it myself. And when I launched that free Facebook group, um, before I launched the sub two community, I launched that free Facebook group and I made 200 grand in that Facebook group. My first month launching it by doing JV deals with people. Yeah. And of course my partner comes along. He's like, so I'm getting half of that 200 grand, right? And I'm like, <laughs> yes, you are, but you need to manage the Facebook group and you need to be in charge of it. And we grew it. I mean, it was like 200 people the first week and I pushed hard. I was doing a live 3 a.m. to 6 a.m. Q and A every day in that Facebook group from 2019 to 2020, like about halfway through 2020. And it, that thing just blew up to the point where we got like to 30,000 people in less than a year. And uh, now what you see is something completely different. I don't go in there that often. I have people that manage it. I spend most of my time in the sub two community, but it, the fact that you went in there and have met people that have changed your life and become your business partners, bro, that's freaking, I'm going to go send this to my partner and tell him neener, 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 you were wrong. <laughs> bro, yeah, that's amazing. I, met, I actually, I think I met two. So I met, I met Mitchell and Mitchell became my partner. And then we added like, once we partnered, all of a sudden more people started jumping in and now there's like six or seven of us. And I mean, it's just a great place for people to network. If you don't, if you don't know a lot about real estate, that's the place to be. Um, especially if you want to be creative and all the stuff, like the, the stuff that your team and community is doing in there is different than, than any other Facebook page. And the way that you also build kind of like a values structure where people help each other and and go there to find people to joint venture with that that's really where it becomes more powerful when you've got a community you know thank and, you uh, yeah you just it, it, it means it, it means the world to me i'll make sure my my team hears this they are not on the front lines as much as i am where i get to go out into the field and i'm you know I'm, i've met you in person i've met julian multiple times but they don't get to do that and so they don't get to hear these stories as often so thank you for sharing that that will make some of my team members entire week yeah awesome man i'm gonna let you guys go on with the rest of the interview i just wanted to pop on for a few minutes and just say thank you for that because obviously you know that's that's a life-changing it's a life-changing event just give me 10 percent of all the stuff you ever buy okay <laughs> okay well <laughs> i'll send you an invoice okay thank you pace thank you justin appreciate you bro. all right talk to you okay awesome pace so so thank you for coming on and uh you know, for the people that are listening, most people are beginners when they're when they're watching podcasts and, you know, getting into this. And so I really wanted to tailor this conversation more to beginners. Um, and so I guess my question is, what would be your action plan if you were to start from scratch, knowing what you know today, 
so that someone can make $10,000 a month in the next three months. Okay, so there's three ways to make money in real estate as like a real actual real estate investor, okay? Mm -hmm. And um, number one is today money. I need money today. Number two is tomorrow money. I'm okay waiting for money for tomorrow, like maybe 30, 45, 180 days max. Then there's forever money, right? The money that you can make for forever. When you're starting out brand new and you're like, I need to make 10 grand this month, we got to go to number one, which is I need money now. I need money in the next 30 days. Between today and the next 30 days, you got to focus on today money. What is today money? Today money is wholesaling. That's today money. Or cater strategy is today money. Those are the two strategies I would use to get today money. Let's not talk about gator today because gator is more around finance than it is about real estate. But mm -hmm. What I would do if I'm like, I got to make 10 grand in the next 24 hours, what would I do? Yeah. This is exactly what I would do. I would go on uh, privy.com and um, the thing that I would look for first is I would go find 10 people that have flips that they have just sold in the last 30 days. Really easy filters. You can go on to privy, click the buttons that that allow you to say, show me flips that have been done in the last 30 days. And those are people that have fixed and flipped. They're actively fixing and flipping in the marketplace. And I would call those people up and say, hey, I saw your house on 123 Main Street. I love what you did with it. I'm brand new to real estate and I'm looking to just find deals for people like you. Mm -hmm. Can you tell me what you're looking for? How quickly you're looking for another project? Are you okay if I find if I if I find you a deal I can make ten twenty thousand dollars on a finder's fee bringing a deal to you that makes sense for you, and I would talk to at least ten of those people. How much time would that take? I already know because I've done this a thousand times. I've done it on the Elephant Challenge. I've done it on other things that I've done. Yeah, and it would take you about two hours to talk to ten people who have just fix and flipped houses in the last thirty days. Pace, why do you want fix and flippers that have? bought or sold in the last 30 days. Well, I know they're active, right? I'm not going back into public records from people that did projects two years ago. I'm looking at people that literally have active projects right now. That I already know they're looking for more. That's their business model. Okay, great. So I've got yeah. 10 people's names, their phone numbers, what they're looking for, how quickly they're looking for a deal. I then, it's very simple. This is like too easy, honestly, mm -hmm. to make 10 grand nowadays. I would go to keegley.com. Right. Jamil has uh, Jamil, one of my best friends, has a website where they sell already contracted wholesale deals on um, their website, Keegley.com, in 110 different cities. Wow. And I would go on that website and I would start looking through all their deals and I would start sending these addresses to these people and saying, hey, I could get this property. And the thing that's so crazy is that you, th you would assume people that are fixing flippers know what Keegley.com is. Mm -hmm. And that why would they need you? Yeah. Oh my gosh, that question just tells me how new you are. You have no idea that fix and flippers are out there fixing and flipping. They're not out there looking for deals or hoping people bring deals to them. They're not actively going on Keegley.com. Another great place to go is Investor Lift. Go to InvestorLift.com. Active deals are being sold right there at discount prices that are already contracted. So you don't have to learn how to cold call. You don't have to learn how to comp. You don't have to learn how to get money. You literally, we like this uh, coming January, Julian, me and Jamil are taking 15 homeless people from the streets of Skid Row and in 10 days making them all $10,000, literally with no experience. They don't even have a house. They have no cars, no cell phones. We are taking 15 random people in January this coming year and turning those unhoused or homeless people, depending on what you want to say, and making them all 10 grand in less than 10 days. It's wow. possible. Yes, it's almost guaranteed. If you just do it two hours a day, you'll, you'll make 10 grand in less than 10 days. That's amazing. Um, and, and a lot of the people that know you, they, they know you from something called subject two. Um, for the people that don't know what subject two is, what, what's a brief explanation of it? Um, I basically go to a homeowner that already has a loan on their house and is trying to get out of that house, but doesn't have any equity. So for example, 
deal we bought a couple of we uh, weeks ago. Seller says, hey, I bought this house six months ago. I, I bought it with an, a VA loan, which means they put no money down, which means now six months later, the market is soft. They don't have any equity. If they try to go through a real estate agent and listen on the property, they would have to write a check out of their pocket mm -hmm. to get rid of that house. So instead, I just go to that seller and I say, hey, how about this? I'll pay you a thousand bucks, maybe a lot of times nothing, and I'll just take over the payments. That's it. It, 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 it's so simple that people are like, wait, wait, how, but how I'm like, I just told you it's that simple. I literally just go and take over the payments. And what do I do with the property? Now that's where it gets a little bit tricky. Yeah. Subject two is the process of just taking over an existing set of payments. That's subject two. Yeah. I don't have to qualify. I don't have to get an approval. A lot of times I don't have to put any money down, but the challenging part is finding out what you're going to do with the property, right? How am I going to make money? This house that we took over a couple of weeks ago, the seller had a payment of 1800 bucks a month. I turned it into a midterm rental that brings in about $5,000 a month. And after all my management, my private money, money fees, like all the things I'm making about 1800 bucks a month net on that one deal. So you've got to find a strategy that you walk away with making more money than what the payments cost you. That's subject to now, the cool thing about subject two is I can find those deals very easily. They're everywhere. And I can then just sell it to somebody else. If I don't want to rental, I can just go, Hey, you take this deal off my hands, pay me 10,000 bucks as a finder's fee, also known as an assignment fee in this real, in our real estate world. Mm -hmm. we, but you in the newbie world, we can just call it a, a, a finder's fee. Mm -hmm. I found this deal. I don't want to keep it. I don't want to buy it. Here is my contract. Pay me $10,000 for that contract. And you get a $10,000 finder's fee. Yeah, so you can also wholesale the sub to deals that you bring. That's really cool. And and yes, sir. and these challenges that you do, you know, with the homeless people, um, you you already have like everything laid out for them to do, and they just have to follow your process so that they can achieve the result, right? Which is the whole the whole point of that purpose. Say that again. So when. The challenge that you're doing with the homeless people where you're, you're teaching them how to wholesale and make $10,000, um, they're, they're following what you teach, right? In, in the sub two community to make that money, right? Correct. Yeah. They will, we will do stuff that costs no money, right? Mm -hmm. So we'll do, we're, we're going to go to a title company. We're actually going to get a uh, fidelity title to sponsor us for this challenge. Mm hmm we're going to go use their boardroom. So we have a place to call phones to use. So these homeless people don't even have to have their own phone, no cell phone, nothing. Mm -hmm. And we're going to ask the, t the title company for a list of expired listings every single day. And the people on the homeless person team, they're going to basically call two hours a day with my guidance and my help and Jamil and his guidance and his help. And everybody's going to lock <laughs> up a deal and make it less at least 10,000 bucks. That's amazing. I love how creative you are about making fun challenges. Uh, to, to make people, you know, learn real yeah, estate. You know, I, I'm going to stop actually calling them challenges. We're going to start calling them missions uh -huh. just because I feel like it is a mission to show people like, Hey, look, these people think they don't have resources. These people think that they've been forgotten. They've been lost right now. Over the next six months, we're actually doing a lot of due diligence, a lot of research on the homelessness crisis. What is going on? The mental health issues associated with it, because I want to be educated on when I'm working with these people you know, what's really going on in the world, at least be educated about it. Yeah. You know, I've watched a hundred documentaries, but I haven't been down there and like really talked to clinical psychologists and people that are 10 years, 20 years on the front lines. Yeah. So we're spending the next six months documenting all of that journey. And at the end of that journey, I'm going to say, I already know I cannot solve their me mental health issues. I already know that I can't solve a lot of the problems that they have going on with addiction and recovery and all that stuff. That's not my job. That's not my lane but I am going to st stand up as a US citizen and say, I'm going to do something about this problem that nobody else seems to have a solution for. And I'm gonna provide an option for them to go and make more money than just doing Instacart. Most people that are homeless, I've been doing a lot of research, how are they making money if they're not panhandling or selling drugs, is yeah. they're doing Instacart and they're riding their bikes around and delivering our food to, to us, right? So that's their best option. Yeah. And the most amount of money that they can make on doing Instacart, um, you know, in the situation they're in is like maybe $1,500, $2,000 a month. And that's what, you know, average rent in the United States is a little over 1700 bucks. 
So how in the hell are they affording to live on $2,000 a month? So yeah. if you give them the ability to make 10 grand a month off of these methods, just by working an hour or two hours a day, every single day, boom, bro, you actually provide an option to the entire homelessness com community and um, actually can change society, which is awesome. Yeah. Yeah. That is amazing. Um, on the topic of philan phil philanthropy, what are causes that you really, you know, care about that you, that you uh, donate to or potentially do something in? You know, I used to donate a lot more money. We, two years ago, we donated like a million bucks, um, which, you know, sounds like a lot to most people for us. We, our company generates a lot of money, so we have a lot of money to give. And yeah. we find that like 18 cents of every dollar that we donate to other people's charity actually makes it way to the people that the charity stands for. And so we decided we're not going to do that anymore. I'm not going to do if if the dollar for dollar does not go to the people, then I'm just going to run my own stuff. Yeah, I would much rather, for example, we're going to put five hundred thousand dollars into the production yeah. of this TV series or this docu series that we're going to do for. Um, we're going to call it uh, "Teach a Man to Fish." Oh, that's really and cool. And that's the that's the name of the series. I'd rather put half a million dollars into producing that so that anybody can watch that, even non homeless people all the way to every homeless pe person in the country. They can be, they can be given a series of videos that they can watch and go, Oh my gosh. And I can go right to a title company. I can go here. I can do this. I can take these steps an hour a day. That is way more impactful than me just giving money to somebody that, you know, no offense, but I just gave my, I gave uh, last year, I gave a couple hundred thousand dollars to a hospital. Yeah. And then they sent out uh, an email. And they're like, we need more money. I'm like, you didn't, you should, maybe you should have sent me an email that said, here's the kids that you affected. Here's what change you actually put forward. Here's how you've actually changed the way our hospital operates with that $200,000 you gave us. No, that, that's not what they do. They're just like, give us more money. And of course they do it pro very professionally. Thank you for your donation. You have no idea. Blah, 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 blah. Da, 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 da. By the way, we need more money. Do you have friends that, do you have friends that maybe have $25,000? And this is a big organization and I'm sitting there going, you're not a storyteller. You didn't tell me a story of how my money actually changed your hospital and how one, maybe it provided beds for kids that couldn't afford it. You didn't give me a name of Timmy, you know, Timmy Smith that was struggling with X, Y, and Z. And because of your money, he's actually back home and so with his parents. Now you got me. You got me because I know that my money actually affected change. It did something. It impacted somebody. And so I'm just kind of over the whole giving money to pe other people to manage it. I kind of look at it like the government, like here I am giving you, I, I haven't paid the IRS in three years, but when other people are paying the IRS, y'all are just handing money to people that don't manage money well, and they're just burning it. Like that is for every hour of my life, I have to go and earn money, right? I, I have, I have yeah. a lot of earned income. When I just give it away like that, I might as well just burn it in my backyard. Yeah. I literally, because that's how other people treat it. They don't respect your money. They're not going to tell you where your money's going. And so if you're out there and you disagree with me, great. Show me a charity that dollar for dollar, I put a dollar in, a dollar goes to the kids. I put a dollar in, a dollar goes to the dogs. I put a dollar in, a dollar goes to the homeless people. That doesn't exist. Does not exist. Everybody has this, even look at the Salvation Army. Yeah. Go Google Salvation Army. Look how much the CEO of the Salvation Army takes home. $6 million a year. Wow. Telling me that's a nonprofit? Come on. Yeah. Come on. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm not saying those are not worthwhile organizations. In fact, they are. And I've donated to them to, for a long time. I just look at it and say, I had, now have resources. I have a team. I have a vision. And I'm going to put all those things together and create a mission that actually goes out and not only helps 15 individuals, but it creates something that is evergreen which now for all time and eternity people can go back and watch that series and so series number one is going to be 15 homeless people series number two will be in 2025 and we're going to um, find single um like widows women who have lost their husbands in combat yeah. who are you know living with their parents with their two kids because they can't afford rent or they can't afford to take care of their kids because the statistic that we found is one out of 30 children in the United States is sleeping in their parents' car. Mm. One out of 30 kids no way. in the United States is sleeping in their parents' car. Oh Why? Because those women that lost their husband in combat 
believe that their best solution in their life is to go and be a Walmart greeter at 18 bucks an hour and barely make ends meet. And then they have to go live in somebody's basement or live in a tiny home or do whatever. We want to provide options to people. And so we'll go to widowed uh, Americans mm -hmm. and help give them options as well and do a, a different but similar challenge. Then we're going to do, um, we're going to do wounded veterans. So people who have basically you know, lost a limb, lost their legs, lost an arm. And we're going to assemble a team of people that are veterans that are like, I can't do any physical work. I'm limited on the type of things that I can do, but you know what I can do is I can do these methods that Pace and Jamil and other people are teaching out there. And so we're going to continue to do the series. And while we're doing this, we're going to be raising money from the local government. Yo, if you, if the government is just going to take government, take our property taxes, mismanage it, they're going to take our, our federal income tax and mismanage it. I'm going to tap in there with grants and other things. I'm going to take some of that money back. And what we're going to do is we're going to go build tiny home villages for these people that are disenfranchised and have forgotten about and uh, create a mission and actually affect change. Like it's one thing to make, become a millionaire, multimillionaire, hundred millionaire in real estate, but what the hell are you doing with it? If you're not passing the torch and helping other people. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so something that I have been doing, uh, you know, set to do is I'm giving 10% of what I'm making to a cause that I like. For example, I am giving people the ability to see a lot of people have cataract and mm -hmm. a simple surgery costs maybe one or $2,000, but you can make someone be able to see again. So something like that is, is really life changing Love for that. people. Um, Love that. Yeah. Love that. Love that. I think at some point, Julian, a smart visionary guy like you, at some point, as you gain resources and team members and your own brand, which obviously you're building right now, at one point you'll wake up and go, it's time for me to actually put the money to work where it should be going to work. Yeah. And I was in the same situation you were in where it's like, I'm going to give my money to somebody else. And that is the right phase and the right trajectory. And you're doing everything perfectly. You're doing what 99% of people on the planet Earth will never do. Yeah. And you're on the path to be like, one day you wake up and you go, all right, I'm going to run this myself. Yeah. And I'm going to get, I'm going to bring donations and I'm going to run this myself and I'm going to put dollar for dollar and have my team, like my team doesn't get paid from the charity. Yeah. My team gets paid for my company and the charity, the money goes in, the money goes to exactly to what we're doing. Right. So cool. I look forward to seeing how you even Im impact that at a higher level where you take control of that and start running it and uh, getting people, getting awareness ar around it. That's going to be exciting. Nice. Nice. Yeah, because I find that sometimes even having the success of real estate, um, it can be a little bit lonely because it's only for yourself, you know, and so being able to give back, that is actually more fulfilling than possibly, you know, having all this for for yourself, you know. Um, Love it, brother. Yep. So, um, so let me ask you this. Um, I, um, w what's important to you personally and professionally? I, I know I, we, we, we try to schedule a podcast with you before. But I know you had a baby on the way. So it's, you know, personally, is your, is your family good? You guys good? Yeah, man, we, we've, you know, we've been, we're in the baby making phase of mm -hmm. life, right? We've got four kids. We've got a massive portfolio, it, the, the largest real estate community in all of the United States. And I would say in the world. Yeah. And doing the most transactions in any real estate community in the world. $5 billion in creative finance transactions were done last year just in our Discord server, which is pretty insane. Yeah. And um, what really means the world to me is using every minute of my day for impact. So waking up in the morning, highlighting other students that have been doing successful deals and putting them on a, st on a pedestal, you know, then taking a minute of my morning, going out, out, hanging out with my kids, helping my wife, jumping on, hanging out with you, networking with you. And then the rest of the day, I'll be out actually training and showing people how to do the things that we do and um, have a team behind me that documents it all so that it becomes evergreen so that other people can learn and see the things. And so everything now is how can I kill five birds with one stone, right? Like yeah. whatever I'm doing, <laughs> it better not just be me talking to one person. It should be me talking to one person. That's one bird. Yeah. Somebody else is filming. It turns into a YouTube video. Somebody yeah. else is um, documenting uh, the back end of what happens with the deal that becomes something that goes into my stu for my students. Yeah. Then we document a long term of like, how did this all make money? And we put it together in a mini series. We give that away in the DMS. We give that away in the Facebook group. We give yeah. it away. We give it away. And it just compounds and compounds and compounds to a point where, you know, like Justin comes in here is like, you changed my life. <laughs> yeah. And so that's what I'm doing on a daily basis is how do I do more of that? 
How do I become more efficient at that? How do I tell more stories that get people off their butt? How do I tell more stories that people go, oh, wow, real estate's actually really simple. It is simple. Mm -hmm. it, and also, it's, I would yeah. say it's not easy. Why is it not easy? Because 99% of anything is mindset. And mindset is not easy to overcome, right? The issues of am I worthy of it? Is it, gonna be, is it possible for me? The mindset of being consistent and the mindset of also doing hard things day to day without seeing immediate result is such a hard thing. I would say that's 99% of real estate. I, showing up every day for 100 days in a row with no expectation of making money, but still showing up on the 101st day going, man, that was a great 100 days. I learned how to be consistent. I learned how to cold call. I learned how to communicate with other human beings. I learned and, and gave myself proof, evidence, that I'm a consistent, reliable human being. And if that is the only thing I overcame in those 100 days, then I am 99% of, of my way to success. And people don't want to hear that, especially when you're brand new. You're like, yeah, I don't care. Just show me how to make 10,000 bucks. Okay, well, I'll show you the technical ways to make 10,000 bucks. And then what will happen is you won't do it. And then you'll DM me and go, Pace, thank you so much for teaching me. Out. I just feel stuck. I yeah. feel stuck. I feel stuck. I feel, no, you don't. You have a mindset issue and you didn't listen to me in the beginning is that you need to overcome these mindset issues in order for the technical stuff to be a, a, a plausible thing for you. And so, you know, we're just trying to be obsessed with those moments of how do we, if I could give, if I could create one pill, it would not be cancer, a cancer cure. Mm -hmm. I could give a shit about cancer. Mm -hmm. Here's and not that I don't say cancer is important, but for me, the pill I would create is a pill that forces you to be consistent at least one hour a day on the hard things. That's it. You take this pill, right? And for one hour, you're consistent on the one thing that you need to be doing, the hard one thing for one hour a day. Here's what would happen. Somebody, somebody would cure cancer, Yeah. right? There's somebody that knows how to cure cancer out there that's just not doing the work. They're not putting the effort in. They're not you know, they're not doing the thing. And it's the same thing, working out, eating healthy, showing up for your wife, showing up for your kids. People just can't do hard things two days in a row. It's, oh, I'm exhausted. I'm exhausted. So I need a day off. <laughs> okay. Well, I can tell you, you've never done jack shit in your life if you need a day off. And here's what I mean by that. People tell me, Pace, you need to slow down. Do you, do you ever stop? Do you ever stay? Man, you, 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 you're going to burn out. Bitch, <laughs> I was a contractor for 10 years. Every day from, my day from the day I quit being a contractor has been a pure vacation. I've alleviated all my stress. I've gotten rid of all my worries. I got rid of all the bull crap clients that steal money from contractors, take advantage from contract. I got out of the business. I'm on permanent vacation. And so I have all the energy, all the time to allocate and basically make my, le my life fun. I wake up in the morning early, four o'clock, I don't need more money. Yeah. I, I want to make my life count. That's the phase I'm in right now. And I look at my calendar at four o'clock in the morning and I'm like, oh, somebody put something on my calendar that I don't want to do. And I reply to them and I go, I, I don't want to, I don't want to go in this meeting. Please have somebody else take care of it. I'm going to go and do the fun things that impact the fun things that change people's lives. And those are the things I'm obsessed with right now and, and creating missions that will change the world. Who's actually solving homelessness right now? There's, there's, Anybody? Yeah, no. it, it's a big issue. No. San Francisco, you know. Bro, it's the it's the whole world. It's everywhere. We're we're going to be flying to Calgary, um, Canada, in about four months, and doing a whole walkthrough of the city, mm -hmm. where we have the the poli uh, politicians from Calgary like, please come up here and document what's going on here. We need the government's help. It's like, no, you don't. You need entrepreneurs' help. You need people that come in and actually build tiny home villages. They can make money. It, you want the government? Here's the only thing the government's good at, spending money. Yeah. So incentivize entrepreneurs to build tiny home communities that get these people off the street and put government money behind paying the rent, right? So that the entrepreneurs don't have to worry about, like, how's this homeless person going to pay the rent on this thing that I just built, right? Then more importantly, teach them things. Teach them how to go make money. Teach them things. Put programs together where they actually learn how to make significant money. Not two grand a month, not three grand a month, not five grand a month, not six grand a month. How can somebody in two hours a day of being consistent team up with other people? Like, think about that. Think about if you did, you found a piece of dirt, city, the city donates the dirt to you on a hundred year lease for no money, 
right? Because there's yeah. dirt that, that, I don't know if you know this, but every city owns dirt. They own lots that nobody's doing anything with. Yeah. And why not just get them to donate that and go, hey, you can lease this land for us for, for $1 a year for the next 100 years. Perfect. Then go get the government to give you grants to go out and build these tiny homes. Perfect. Now get the government to pay for the rent, kind of like a Section 8 program where they guarantee the rent for these people that are homeless. Get them off the street. And then have the government pay you for a program where you hire social workers that work at the 40 unit, 50 unit encampment where these 50 people now have a centralized office in the center of the um, community where they can all come in and work on real estate, wholesaling, real estate, fixing and flipping, financial services. They actually can come in and run their own individual business. Now you are changing the world. Yeah. Yeah, that that is so those those are the things I'm obsessed with. Yeah, that's such a clear way to to make a big difference in this world. And uh and, and it it sounds like you have something that is a massive transformative purpose, which is something that really is like a moonshot that you really want to achieve, you know, you know, as a legacy for yourself. And this is it. Um, is the question, well, how am I building a legacy for myself? Yeah, yeah. So um, there, there's there's a thing called the MTP, which is a massive transformative purpose. It's something that Peter Diamandis uh, coined. Tony Robbins follows it. Elon Musk follows it. You know, it's other people that want to make a big difference like yourself. And so it sounds like for you is impacting the world and just solving problems that are like homelessness, you know, and, and, and other things. Yeah. Yeah. That's really big. Well, I, you know, I had a brother, um, one of the things that I'm passionate about is I had a brother named Corbin that hung himself due to drug addiction mm. and I lo we lost him 17 years ago. So I was 20, I was 24, he was 22. Mm -hmm. And so it was, you know, in our adult years, right. Yeah. The tra transformation of going from an, from a young adult to a full adult and taking on responsibilities and I lost my, my best friend. I mean, I named my daughter after him. Like that's how important that relationship was to me. So yeah. I just feel like, look, bro, I got a, I got a great family. I got health. I got all this stuff. I have friends. I have a great team. I have money. I have these things. Like what the hell are you doing with your life? If you're not turning around and passing the torch. So is it really for creating legacy? Not really. Mm -hmm. I I'm going to die. People are going to forget about me. Who cares about me when I go to God, when I go up to God in heaven, hopefully, and God's like, yo, did you use all the tools I was throwing in your path? Did you pick up enough of the tools to like actually go utilize them? My answer is going to be, I tried my damnedest. Yeah. Other people are going to be like, man, all I was doing is focusing on my bills and my retirement and going on cruises and living my best life on the beach and da, 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 da. It's like, all right, that's cool. So is it legacy? No. It's so that I can have an honor, honest conversation with God that he gave me all these gifts. I have all my limbs. I have both my eyeballs. I have my voice. I have all my hair. I mean, go, go down to the smallest, yeah. little, stupidest thing. God gave me so many amazing gifts. And if I don't use them, then I'm wasting them. And it's like slapping God in the face and saying, hey, I'm entitled to this. This is mine. No, it's not mine. I am a vessel for, for his purpose. I'm a vessel for the universe to say, go and do cool things. And if nobody remembers me, so be it. Yeah. Yeah. That's powerful. Um, on, on that mindset that you touched on a little bit earlier, um, what are some shifts that you have seen that people need to make in order to be able to actually, you know, stay consistent, actually see, you know, have the 80% of mindset plus the 20% of skills to actually make some money or, or change someone's life, you know, change their world. Some, some of the biggest changes you need to have is you need to get your, your own butt in gear. You need to clean up your own house, right? Like I, I hired this kid yesterday. Mm -hmm. His name's Nathan. Hopefully he hears this. Yeah. And I go, Hey, let's take my truck down, drop it off at the shop. You drive me back. Right. He's just like a gopher guy. He does all these like little things for me right now. He's texting me like, Hey, I found this little thing in the backyard. It's not supposed to be right sitting here. It's a bundle of cords. Where should I put it? Right. Yeah. And it's like, he's doing all these little things around the house. So I walk around my house. There's nothing to do. There's no honeydews. There's no, no things just sitting around doing nothing. Like everything's done. And then in, in the afternoon, he works in my lending business and he he's driving me back from dropping off my truck. Yeah. 
And I look at his car. I'm like, bro, you haven't vacuumed this thing in five years. You haven't, like, there's dust on your dashboard. Do you not drive around and notice this stuff? Yeah. And he's like, well, I don't ever have anybody in here, Mike. Your excuse wow. is that nobody else comes into your car, therefore you don't need to clean your car because you don't care about how your environment is. Mm -hmm. You care about yourself that little that you're okay not spending 45 minutes every month just deep clean your car because you should have an environment that you are inspired by and you are proud of. And he was like, wow, I never thought about it that way. I'm like, welcome to mindset shifts, right? <laughs> your parents didn't teach you this. I imagine your parents are gross and dirty and they don't clean up after themselves. I don't know about you, but my mom was like, made me do my own laundry, made me clean up my own stuff, create an environment. Dude, I, my mind cannot work if I have clutter in my life. And so clutter in your life is far beyond a dirty bedroom, a dirty car, a dirty this. It's yeah. also a dirty mind. It's a dirty finances. It's a, it's a, you know, an unkempt email account. It's all the things that you are not doing. And that's why I wake up so early and I get all the things out of my way, the emails, the text messages, the communication. I plan my day. I time block and I go, these are the things I'm going to execute today. If I was only given today, my last day on earth, how am I going to execute today properly? Am I going to have 30 minutes of chill time where I'm just scrolling through my phone mindlessly? No, absolutely not. And so it's all common sense. It's just interesting. People are like, but what do I do? What, but tell me what to do. And so that's part of the mindset stuff too, is that there, people aren't educating themselves beyond high school and beyond some college and beyond what your parents and your pastor told you. They don't know shit. Mm -hmm. I'm, even your pastor doesn't know shit. He doesn't. Yeah. If he did, he'd be a business person, <laughs> right? Yeah. Your parents don't know shit. And so at some point you have to go from, you know, weaning off of your parents, weaning off your church pastor, we, weaning off your college professors who don't know shit about anything either, and go, I'm gonna go find mentors and other people, whether it's books, seminars, YouTube videos, and I'm gonna start taking notes and journal. Guys, I journal everything every day. Mm -hmm. I carry around a journal right here and I type out everything I learn. I, I type out people's names that I meet. I draw pictures of this is, some, this is a vision I have. I mean, th just in the last 30 days, I've got paper, things and things and things and things. Even if I never go back and review those notes, just me writing down these little things I learned or ideas I had, those things are magnificently transformative. And most everybody else is just going through their lives, receiving whatever life sends to them. I am not that way. I'm not waiting for the enemy to come to me and defending myself. I am going on offense and I am attacking the enemy. And so the enemy is idle time. It's idle hands. It's dead time on my calendar. I'm attacking, attacking, attacking. And so that's, I think, a little bit of a difference that people are doing right now as they're sitting here potentially listening to the podcast going, man, I've, all I've been doing all my whole life is just receiving what other people bring to me. My, my boss tells me what to do, when to be, do it, what not to do, when to take a break, when not to take a break, when to take vacation, when um, to go to lunch, when to go home, when to clock in. My boss tells me, um, what not to do, who not to talk to, what department to avoid, what department to collaborate with. I literally all day long receive instruction. And that is not how the entrepreneur works. The entrepreneur attacks and creates opportunity, which is the polar opposite of the nine to five mentality. And that is one of the biggest skills I would, I would change is instead of receiving all day long, go and create, go out there in the world. And people go, but what, how, how do I do that? You even need a boss to tell me you how to do that. So go hire a mentor. Go get, get a mentor that says, this is the things to do. Or go, you know, watch one of my challenges and say, oh, Pace is showing people what to do for an hour to two hours every single day. Okay, I'm going to follow along and I'm going to do the thing. Guess what? You still won't do shit. So the biggest thing that you got to do is go do those things plus get a battle buddy. Go find somebody in the free Facebook group like Justin talked about, right? The free Facebook group. He's like, dude, I found my business partner. Now we have, we have we're going to have 500 doors by the end of the year. Justin realized I'm not doing this on my own yeah. because if I was going to do it on my own, I would have done it on my own. My first 45 years on the planet, I didn't. So it's time for me to go get a partner that we can hold each other accountable and then go and do the instructional things together and, and, uh, and hold our feet to the fire. That is a perfect recipe. Yeah. Yeah. That, that's amazing. I, I love that. Um, on, on something that you touched on, I noticed that one of your superpowers is 
being able to speak to someone just in conversation, you know, um, real estate is all about, you know, the conversation, you know, that's where the deals are done. And so I wanted to talk to you about um, what is, you know, how, how did you train yourself to be such a good speaker, you know, whether it's through a seller or to the public or, you know, to anybody, um, what are some things that you can um, tell someone that wants to be, you know, a really good speaker like yourself and have that superpower too? Be genuinely curious in other people, right? Other people, I, I mean, you're interviewing me, so obviously I'm talking more on the podcast. That's the way the dynamic works. Yeah. But the way it normally works in a conversation is that I am I shut the hell up. Yeah. And I do two things. Two things. I'm genuinely curious about the person in front of me. I'm not waiting for my turn to speak. Mm -hmm. That's number one. Number two I take the things that I learn and I compliment those people to encourage them to talk more. Mm -hmm. That's how you become a conversationalist. There you go. That's it. That's it. Pretty simple. Yeah. And the problem is most people wait to speak rather than seek to understand the human being in front of them. So what I do, if you want to talk about speaking on stage, I speak on 100 plus um, messages a, a day. I'm sorry, 100 plus stages a, a year. And what I do is I go to the audience and I sit in the audience and I watch the people that are listening to the speaker before me, before them, before them, before them. And I'll sit there for four speakers and take down notes of, oh, they're laughing here. They're noticing this. Okay, this audience really loves it when people drop the F-bomb. I'm not an F-bomb dropper, but yeah. that's the audience we've, we've got here. Okay, we've got people that, are, that love the, they, when somebody brings up the gospel, they all perk up. They get excited about gospel. Oh, somebody brought up God and people shrunk. Okay, that's not something I should be bringing up. I observe the audience before I go on stage. Mm -hmm. And then I go backstage and I craft a 30-minute message based on a story I've, I've actually gone through. And I go, what story in my life is applicable to what this audience needs right now? Mm -hmm. And I intertwine a message into the story that I've already gone through. And that's, that's the other thing, it goes back to the same thing, like go out and attack your day. All I do all day long is create stories. That's my life, every day is a story of mine. I journal, I write things down, I write down what's going on in my day. I have a story for every topic that you could bring up. Detailed stories, people's names, money that was made, people's lives are transformed. Every single topic you give me, I go, oh, I got it. And then I can also address the audience differently based on what their desires and needs are uh, based on sitting in the audience, you know, two, three hours before I speak. Yeah, yeah that's powerful. So listen, listening to the audience and seeing what they really need. Um, that's incredible. Um, if, if you had one person that you could get to know right now, maybe that is dead or is alive, but you just haven't reached out to, who would that person be? Uh, dead. Um, I would say dead. I would say Napoleon Bonaparte. Uh -huh. And the reason being is that he was a strategic thinker, a very strategic thinker. And I don't meet a lot of strategic thinkers, people that are thinking 10 moves ahead, 15 moves ahead and understanding how the enemy will react in real time type of stuff. Napoleon would be great from that regard. Mm -hmm. Alive. I would get to know my wife. And some people nice. are like, well, don't you know your wife? I go, yeah, but my wife changes every day as she should. And um, I want her to, I want, I don't want to recognize my wife in a year and I don't want my wife to recognize me in a year. I want us to constantly be evolving and changing and adapting to each other's growth. And if I could spend 10 hours with somebody, it would be sitting with my wife, getting to know her on, on an even deeper basis. That's powerful. That, that says a lot about you and your marriage. Uh, yeah, that's incredible. Um, now g given that you have, you know, this very important person in your life, your, your wife, um, what are some things that you do, you know, with her on a daily basis that maybe you can give advice to us that are unmarried or looking for a loved one? Um, don't ask her how she's doing, watch how she's doing and bring things to the table without asking. So for example, mm -hmm. If your wife is overwhelmed, exhausted, 
And it's like at a very specific time of the day where she's just like, I need, you know, I, I, my wife has, we have a lot of kids. Yeah. There's moments in the day where she has a harder time than others. And it's based on maybe getting the kids ready, right? Kids are all getting in the bath. She's getting them ready. She's going to take the kids out to class. Don't ask your wife if you, she needs your help. Put a break in your schedule at that time frame and go and just start helping and walk, you, you know, take care of the kids. My kids don't get ready at six o'clock, seven o'clock, eight o'clock in the morning. My kids get ready at like 11 o'clock. Mm -hmm. Why? Because my wife is doing things outside with them and they're doing activities in the morning and they're doing fun things. And then they don't get cleaned up until like 11, 11 to one. And then my wife takes them to classes the rest of the day, like dance class and tumbling and stuff like that. So there's times in the day, 11 to one, where she's overwhelmed. So I try and I make sure that I'm home for those moments. I didn't ask her if she needed help. I watched, I noticed, and I delivered that help without talking about it. Guys, if you're a man out there, go read the book, How to Improve Your Marriage Without Talking About It. It's an amazing book. Wow. And for you men that are out there like, what's wrong? My wife, I never know what's wrong. Yeah, I know. I know what's wrong is you're asking her about her day instead of watching and noticing her day. And then you're asking what you can bring to the table rather than being resourceful and figuring it out without talking to her. Women don't want you. They don't want you to say, here, I'll give you a good example. Women out there in the audience despise men that do this kind of crap. I pull up to your day. I pull up to your house to pick you up for a date and I honk the horn. Mm -hmm. They hate that. Yeah. That's pretty obvious. Yeah. Let me tell you the thing that's not so obvious, but I see it all the time. You walk up to the, you, you don't honk because that's pretty obvious. You walk up to the door, you knock on the door, you welcome her, you greet her, you hold her hand, you walk her down the stairs, you open up the door, all of the things you think you should be doing. And then you get into your side, you jump in the car and you go, so what do you want to do? Huh? That's a cardinal sin, you piece of shit. <laughs> not, not you, Julian, but the audience. <laughs> yeah. A cardinal sin is not having a plan. Mm -hmm. Women want a man with a plan. And so when I see people, men that are like, yeah, I took her on a date. What'd you guys do? Oh, I just asked her what she wanted to eat. No, dude. You tell that woman, this is where I'd like to take you. I'd like to show you an experience. I'd like to take you to places that are important to me. And da, 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 da. And you take her. We're going here. We're going here. We're going here. Or even throw in some surprises. Give her an experience. Mm -hmm. And the best part of the experience is that you have a plan, you know where you're going, you pre-planned it because women want to know that you are thinking about them before you pick them up. Laziness yeah. is the, uh, the disease that women absolutely hate. And the reason why a lot of women will marry lazy men is because they see something in that man. They go, oh, he just needs to grow up a little bit and I'm going to believe in him and I'm going to be here to support him. And a lot of these men have the Peter Pan syndrome, which is I don't ever want to work. Um, grow up. I just want to keep being a child. I want, I want my mom to make my bed and I want this to happen. I want that to happen. Guys, stand up, be a man, be a man. go read that book. Um, how to improve your marriage without talking about it. One of the best books you'll ever read. Yeah, that, that's amazing. That's a huge, uh, gem right there. Um, so let's, uh, let's talk about real estate for these last few minutes. Um, what, what kind of deals are you excited about right now? What, what really moves you right now? Um, bigger deals, you know, I, we've got 300 single family homes in the, in the portfolio, which is great. Mm -hmm. All of those were purchased with creative finance, no banks, no credit, no, no, none of that stuff, which is awesome. We revolutionized the creative finance game. Yeah. Um, our team is the number one team in the country for creative finance, which is amazing. Mm -hmm. But now we're getting to a point where we've got more mouths to feed. And so we can't just go after single family deals anymore. We've, we've moved to the next phase of growth which is we've got to buy things that are a hundred doors or larger, right? Yeah. In order to make an impact on the portfolio and make an impact on the families that are surviving off of that portfolio. And so yeah. most of the deals we're doing now are big 200 plus unit deals, seller finance. We've got a couple that are a hundred percent seller finance, which means the seller, and this is kind of a fun story. I've got a deal in Indiana, mm -hmm. a seller, not a real estate investor. Yeah. The CPA says, you need to buy an apartment complex. We need to save you money on taxes and you need to go do a cost segregation, which you know helps wipe out your, your active income. Yeah. And we need to stop hemorrhaging on the taxes you're paying on your other business. Yeah. Go buy an apartment building. A broker tells this guy to go buy this apartment building. This guy is like, I'm a smart businessman, not a real estate guy, but I'm a smart businessman. I'm going to go and renovate these units and I'm going to go raise the rents. And I mean, he knew nothing about real estate, <laughs> about a 
twenty million dollar asset, knew nothing about real estate. He's getting his kick, his his face kicked in, yeah. and he comes to us and goes, "I'm in a bad situation." We don't. He doesn't come to us. We went to him, right? Our outreach, our cold calling. Yeah, and um, we do a deal with him where he says, "Just take over the asset. No down payment and no payments to me." until you get the asset stabilized. And so those are the deals that I'm excited about. It means that I can go take over this property, no money, no yeah. credit, no nothing. Yeah. I can go in and get tenants moving into the property because this guy just can't figure it out. And then once the property is cash flowing significantly, then we start making payments to him as if he's the bank. And he then, this benefits him in a big way. Why? Because he's in a bad situation. Yeah. Two, he, if he sells the property right now on the market, He's going to lose money that he put into it. He's also going to lose that time. More importantly, he used tax savings that the IRS allowed him to use. And if he sells that property, he has to pay that tax savings back to the IRS. Call, and that's called um, depreciation recapture. Yeah. And he's like, oh my gosh, if I sell this on the market, I'm going to have to pay a million dollars in taxes. I don't have that. And so he's letting us take over the asset 100% with no payments because that helps him mitigate all of those problems. So those are the deals I'm really interested in right now. Significantly sized deals, no money to get into the deal, saving a seller's problem and getting a massive asset in the portfolio. Yeah, those deals are amazing. Um, of course, no money in, that, that's incredible. And uh, mainly you're doing multifamily and uh, I, I noticed, uh, you know, I heard earlier you were also talking about RV park. So well, you're, you're focusing more on the, the high unit uh, asset types, kind of like multifamily, RVs, mobile home parks. Is, is that right? Um, um, I haven't bought a mobile home park in three years. I, I would love to buy mobile home parks. It's just not something that we focus on. Yeah. And they're good assets. If you told me, hey, apartments are no longer an option, I would go to mobile home parks probably exclusively. It's a great asset class. Yeah. In fact, I would switch it out with apartment complexes and say that in some ways it's even better. But it's just not what we do, right? Yeah. And that's hard for people that are new to understand. Like, well, why? Does that mean it's not a good thing? Like, why wouldn't you be doing all of it? Guys, you can't do everything in real estate. Real estate is so abundant in opportunities. You cannot do it all. It's, impo it's physically impossible. So you have to pick a lane. Our lane is creative finance, purchasing larger assets. So why did I buy RV parks? I bought those just six months ago. In fact, I'm in, under contract to buy another one right down the road from this, the one I bought six months ago. Why? Mm -hmm. Why do I want the RV parks? Because I live there in the summertime up in Montana and it's cool to drive by a property that you own mm -hmm. and be able to stop by and create content on something that you're making money on. And so I bought RV parks in Montana because they were on seller finance and I got into them with basically no capital out of my pocket and they're making money. Yeah. But that's not my focal point. Yeah. Right. That's my either is buying a gas station. But why would I buy a gas station? Well, because it's right down the road from my house. I want my kids to be able to drive by and be like, our family owns that. I want my kids to be able to see the assets. Whereas like with single family there, it, you drive by a single family house. I can't really stop and go, Hey guys, let's go into the house that we own. I have tenants in there. Yeah. Right. So having gas stations or RV parks that we own is kind of a cool thing to show my kids. And I can also give my kids summer jobs at the RV park doing maintenance and all that kind of stuff. Then, um, so I only buy those things as like hobby projects. The apartment complexes are easier to manage. They bring in more cash that so you can have a full-time management team. They scale faster. Mm -hmm. You have 10% vacancy um, on the property. It still makes money. 10, you know, 10% of your, your units are not rented out. You're still making money. Yeah. And it's just overall easier once you get into that realm. Um, the hardest part about multifamily though, guys, is that it's not for everybody. Um, it's a phase that you have to work into. Some people go, yeah, you can start multifamily right away. For my more advanced audience members, yeah, the best way to get started in multifamily is to do a fund of funds, which I don't have time to explain what that is, but write that down, do a re do research research on it. Fund of funds, yeah, okay, um, or invest in somebody else's deal. Those are the two ways. Like I get a lot of people invest in our fund, um, sub two fund, and they're like, I want to get into multifamily, but I don't want to manage it. Yeah, okay, those are the two ways you can get into multifamily today. Mm -hmm. You want to go and buy a multifamily right now, a hundred unit deal. Good luck with the management of that thing. Good luck with a hundred tenants, yeah, a hundred potential people turning over, a hundred potential flood problems, a hundred potential, you know, killings. Uh, the first day I bought my RV park, 
somebody shot another person literally the day after I closed escrow on it, wow. killed somebody. We had to call the cops and there was a dead person laying in the middle of the RV park that we had to like do a crime scene thing. Welcome to real estate, yeah. my friends. And so starting in single family is typically 99.9% .9 of the time, the advice I would give to everybody. Yeah. Yeah. That, that sounds great. Um, the fund of funds is a really, uh, cool model, um, too. So, um, now, now that you, um, you have this community, right. And what, what do you look five years down the road is to see like, what can sub two become, you know, what, what new things can we expect to see? Um, okay. So our community is going to lead the industry in not just transactions, but also in localized meetups all over the country and also brands. Mm -hmm. You will see more people branded and running their own individual brand and segment of this community than you will see on any other show, bigger pockets, anything else. We, we will have the most recognized figures in our community running individual lanes in the community, such as RV parks, mobile home parks, um, you know, land development, land flipping, lease options, all the things that you can yeah. imagine, every category in all, all of sub two. Sub two was never meant to be just a creative finance community. Sub two doesn't just mean buying a house subject to. Yeah. Sub two is always about, we are going to live our lives subject to our own rules. And that was the reason why I chose sub two as the name of the community was, we're gonna just adjust to what the market is doing, which means, our real estate investing strategy is subject to what is going on in the real estate space. And so sub two is far more than just buying houses sub two. It is changing with the marketplace. So right now, new home development, tiny homes, co-living are massive. And so we pivot, change, and we do new education around those things. Yeah, that, that, that sounds really cool. I love that uh, definition of the subject to community. Um, that's incredible. And, uh, can you tell us a little bit more of uh, maybe some other stories that you've like one story that you have um, been able to create in your community about someone else, like changing their lives completely um, through the things that you teach? Bro, we, I have over 7,000 people that have quit their jobs because of what we do. I, like I could go on for years and years about <laughs> stories on stories on stories. I've got um, hundreds of people, hundreds of people that have helped other people get hundreds of deals. Mm -hmm. We call that the Midas touch in our community. Mm -hmm. I have so many stories you'd freaking lose your brain over. But <laughs> since it's the end of the podcast, what I'll do is I'll tell people, go to my Get Creative podcast and I do a daily 15 minute episode with somebody's life that was changed. That's 356 episodes a year. Yeah, And I could probably do two a day three a day and maybe even four a day and still not tap into how many people's lives have changed because of our community. I could literally do 13, 1400 episodes a year of people that are like, I did my first deal. I got my 10th door. I got 220 doors. Look at Justin. Yeah. Right. Not even in my community, in my free Facebook group. And he bought 220 doors with a partner he met in my free Facebook group. So think about what the sub two community does for people at a much higher, more elevated, more connected, more vetted, environment. It's absolute insanity. Yeah. Yeah. That's incredible. Awesome. Um, so last question, um, we we're, we're in uh, some tough times right now, you know, for, for most people with interest rates being high, kind of like the economic indicators, what, what do you see the real estate market, uh, changing in the next maybe couple of years and like, how can we prepare to be, you know, uh, taking advantage, you know, take, take advantage of this opportunity that we have. Couple of things. Name a time in history where people were not saying real estate's hard right now. There's been so many. Yeah. It, it it every year, every year the market's gonna crash. This is gonna happen. Oh my gosh! But it, 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 there's always a thousand challenges, guys. Just turn off all the noise. Yeah. And acquire real estate. Turn off all the noise and acquire real estate. Use creative finance. I, I'm disgusted by the birth strategy. I'm disgusted, disgusted by traditional methods. If you're using creative finance, what do you care what the Fed's doing? Mm -hmm. If you're using creative finance, what do you care who the president of the United States is? If you're using creative finance, what do you care what the immigrant crisis is coming across the border? You have a solution for those people. Yeah. Go and acquire real estate. That's the answer to it. Doesn't matter if it's today doesn't matter if it's 10 years from now, the answer and the solution has always will be, has always been and will always be 
acquire real estate, turn it into cash flowing assets, hold those assets. They make tons of appreciation over time. You'll become a millionaire. Do you want to know how to become a millionaire? Buy five rentals and, and wait three years. Boom. Yeah. Buy five rentals in one year, sub two or seller finance, wait three years, you're a millionaire. There, there you go. People are like, oh, I, I need to be a millionaire. Guys, there's people that work off a job for 40 years that retire with $300,000 in their 401k. Go buy five rentals and wait three years. Cut the line. Get, away, get around all that crap and don't listen to the noise. Don't listen to the news. Don't listen to the crap on YouTube. Acquire real estate. There's never been a time ever that was a bad time to buy real estate. Well, Pace, what about the market crash of 2007 and eight? Guys, even if I bought at the top of the market and I had a cash flowing asset and I held onto that asset through the crash, and it was still cash flowing, right? I had renters in there even through the crash. That whole entire eight year decline of the market, which it took a long time, it took about eight years to like really truly start coming back around. The tenant would have been paying down your debt and the property goes back up in value. You missed all those eight years of people paying down your mortgage. Mm -hmm. There's never been a bad time to buy real estate ever. Yeah, agreed, 100%. Thank you so much. So Pace, um, where can we, you know, find you obviously for the people that don't know you first timers. Um, what's the best way to get to know you, you know, on, on social media. Um, guys go to YouTube. Don't go to Instagram. Don't go to Facebook. Don't go to LinkedIn. Don't go to any of those places. YouTube is where we have long form content, deal breakdowns, addresses, proof, paperwork, documents, all the things that you need. Go to the YouTube channel. We have 3000 videos and we spend about $2,000 per video to produce these videos. So, Think about that. Yeah. I've spent $6 million on my YouTube channel over the last three years. Think about that. That is insanity. I've spent a lot of money to produce free co content for you. Go and watch it. Me talking to sellers, me breaking things down, me walking through a transaction, me, you know, showing how money gets raised, highlighting other people that are doing deals all over the country. Just go to my YouTube channel. Uh, just Pace Morby. That's awesome. Thank you so much, Pace. We'd love to have you back another time. And for now, um, hope you have a good one. Thank you, Julian. You're the freaking man. You're freaking awesome. Great questions. I appreciate you tremendously. Guys, make sure you give Julian some love. Subscribe to his podcast. Give him some reviews. Those things go a long way. When you're working on building up a podcast and a brand, the best thing that you can receive is a thank you through the form of a review. Give this guy five stars on Apple, um, iTunes, or Spotify. Let him know how much you appreciate him delivering this content to him to you that you can open up your mind to a new level of understanding that you didn't have before. Julian, later, brother. Thank you.